Welcome to the All Together Show. I'm your host, Eric Satz, and with me today is the 32nd chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Nice to be with you. So, you know, when when you hold a position, an office as public as chairman of the SEC, I'm sure lots of people like to say uh, lots of stuff, especially people who probably don't even know you. So my question for you is, in your own words, who's Jay Clayton? Huh. Well, uh, I, I, I hope I'm self-aware enough to get it maybe 50 percent or more correct. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm an optimist. For for your purposes, I'm fascinated by markets. Uh, markets also make you a realist. So hopefully, hopefully, I've learned lessons and a, a bit of a realist. Uh, I enjoy my friends and family, and you know, it may not be the most popular thing to say these days, but having traveled a lot of the world and done so for business and otherwise. Uh, I'm a big believer and proponent of America. I, I I think it ought to be a popular thing to say today. So I love hearing you say that. Well, I, I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> Excellent. So, but, let, but let's go back to the beginning. Uh, where where were you born, and where did you grow up? So I was born in Newport News, Virginia, what was then McDonald Army Hospital, uh, Fort Eustis. And shortly thereafter, moved actually back in with my mother's parents because my father shipped off to Vietnam and then grew up in central Pennsylvania until about the sixth grade. And after that, in what you would think of as late 1970s, early 1980s suburbia outside Philadelphia. So you you go off to uh, Lafayette College. Uh, where where you are, of course, uh, a soccer player, which I, as a former college soccer player, will say with some pride. Um, you were probably position? better than I was. Uh, I don't know about that. What position did you play? Uh, I was a goalie, believe it or not. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, crazy type. There you go. Once upon a time. So, um, you know, I asked you to fill out a questionnaire a little before we got on air and I, I asked who taught you about finance, who taught you about money? And you said your grandparents. Can you can you share a little of that story? Uh, well, sure. My my grandfather on my father's side was a lifelong economist um, at the Department of Agriculture. And most of what he taught me was from trying to save his government salary or a portion of his government salary for retirement and investing it in the in the market. So, uh, you know, anecdote, uh, crazy enough or wise enough to invest in one of the first LBOs and buy the bonds, which turned out to be uh, a good thing. So, you know, just learning from him on how to take what was not a lot of money at the time and turn it into enough money to make a, a reasonable difference in retirement was kind of neat. Um, on my on my mother's side, uh, again, a uh, government official in a, uh, a lot of cases, uh, had to support a number of people and uh, you know, learning what, what that took uh, each day from him uh, was, uh, was a pretty remarkable thing. So before you get to the SEC, you're a lawyer, you're a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell for, uh, for a good period of time. What, what drew you to the law to begin with? Um, I was in the law out of interest and curiosity. Uh, decided to take a job after a clerkship with one of the more prestigious and uh, larger New York firms because I thought it was the quickest way to get access to what business and business decision making was all about. Now, that may not sound uh, like a traditional route to find that. But lawyers tend to find themselves at the center of uh, significant transactions for companies, once you know, once every five years type transaction. And that's a very interesting place to be. And I thought I would be at Sullivan and Cromwell for maybe 18, 24, 36 months 
the <laughs> max and then ended up staying for 20, two, three, whatever, whatever the number is, because I just liked it. So, you know, that's an interesting segue. We're, we're getting there a lot faster than I was expecting in terms of, in, you know, being in the middle of really interesting transactions. And so if I take us back to 2007, 2008, you found yourself in the middle of uh, the financial crisis uh, and Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. I'm wondering if you can share some stories from those accounts and kind of what you learned as part of those processes. Sure, sure. And it really, pe- people think the timeline kind of starts in, a, and I'll get my dates roughly correct, in March with Bear Stearns, but it goes back to the to the previous year and the monoline insurers, the the AMBACs, the MBIAs, who had who had wrapped, you know, uh, insured uh, RMBS, residential mortgage backed security exposure, and you were starting to see the cracks in the housing market at that time. The those those entities came under stress uh, as to whether those guarantees and insurance contracts that they had provided would, be, would actually be hit upon. Uh, and then that segues into, you know, Bear Stearns, which had uh, real liquidity issues, uh, and and again that sort of fire sale to to J.P. Morgan. Fast forward along uh, through the summer, you had your troubles at what we call the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, again, it was just the mortgage market continuing to deteriorate, continuing to deteriorate. That manifests itself finally at Lehman, where it's not just residential mortgages, but it's property markets uh, generally. Um, and there we are. What do you learn? You, you learn that uh, when there is a giant dislocation in the core of the financial markets, vastly different from the dot-com bubble, um, everyone f- flees to safety. Everyone flees to safety. And that in and of itself creates all sorts of liquidity problems. That, that you really can only solve with central bank intervention. And, and that's, what, that's what we saw. And um, I'll, I'll fast forward and say the lessons learned, the muscle memory from that period of time meant that in March of 2020, when we decided to shut down the economy and potentially do the same thing to markets, dislocate the right. core markets in our financial system, People were ready for what kind of government intervention would be required. Hard lesson to hard lesson to learn, but uh, glad we we took some positives from it. Yeah. So we were ready. Yeah, and, and some of the same people were around. So you had you know Jay Powell, Randy Quarles, uh, Steve Mnuchin had all seen this movie before in 2008 and knew how important it was to shore up markets as quickly as possible. So what was the biggest surprise when you arrive in Washington? What, what Was it the politics or was it something else or was neither really a surprise? I think the, the politics, not that they existed, but how they manifested themselves um, was was the bigger surprise that um, and not everybody, but there are a number of people in Washington. Who, I, I always tell a story about you know deals. It's hard to do a deal when there's a person on one side or the other who thinks if the other person is willing to agree to it, it must be a bad deal for me. <laughs> now, that's a really hard person to do a deal with in a commercial world. Right. Washington is, and there may be like 5% of the people, 10% of the people you run into like that in the, in the commercial world. The, the percentage in Washington is much higher. It's like, if, if you want to do this, it must be bad for me. I'm like, you know, no, there's, there's a lot of times that you can, uh, you can, you can move the ball forward in a way that's good for everybody. So as a lawyer, uh, certainly there's a, there's a, a pace and at times an urgency to transactions. Did, was that hard to adjust to in terms of pace and 
uh, trying to get things done as as you ended up in Washington? Well, we we had a um, and I had a tremendous crew. I, any anything that I say to you that worked out well, I I had no less than a dozen people working with me who were you know terrifically talented, including many of them at getting deals done. That's that was that was something, and we took a tactic that I think. I think was wise. And that was we laid out our agenda very clearly, just like you would in a sort of complicated transaction in the, uh, in the commercial world. And then we tried to stick to it. And it wasn't just for external people. It was for internal people as well. Letting the people who worked with us, the staff know that, you know, this is what's expected of you, not more, not less. And got to be there to support you. You know, did that in a very transparent way. I'm sure people have done it before, but it seemed to resonate both inside and outside the building. Did market activity during, you know, so you were there 2017 through 2020. Did did the markets behave in a way to uh, help facilitate your agenda and what you were trying to accomplish, or were there parts that um, that made it more difficult? So a couple of answers to that. First, going back to the agenda and, and bandwidth and what you try to accomplish, we factored in some measure of time for things that we didn't know now, but we knew <laughs> would hit us. Right. Didn't, didn't didn't fill up all the buckets uh, from the start, so that that helped when things like uh, the ICO craze came along, and people were were raising money off the back of envelopes, um, you know, in, in complete and uh, uh, shockingly uh, uh, blatant violation of the securities laws. But you know, the, we, we we worked through that. Uh, what we did have was the markets were relatively stable. They were relatively stable. There were some ups and downs and whatnot until March of 2020. That, of course, gives gives you room, uh, and that's a and that's a testament to the folks at the Treasury and the Fed who who did take on a very what I would say is uh, transparent and uh, outcome oriented view of the economy. Um, you know, three percent growth, three percent unemployment. Those those were you know the real targets, so that was pretty good. Um, then uh, the government shutdown was tough to deal with because you actually have to shut down. So that was a little bit of a hiccup. In the road. And then the thing that probably had the most effect was COVID because you did need to have you know all hands on deck pivot to how do we keep how do we keep the markets operating? Right, because we're all moving home. How do, how do we help facilitate the kind of refinancing deals that you need to shore up balance sheets? I mean, everybody who had debt coming due, significant amounts of debt coming due in the next 24 months, needed to term out their debt to feel more comfortable. Um, how, do you, how do you facilitate all of those transactions? So, of course, you had to put some of the, what I would call the, the programmatic agenda uh, on a slower burn. So I, I can't believe I'm about to ask you this after you've just mentioned ICOs, but what, why is it that people feel like investors need to be protected from themselves uh, at least by using wealth as a measure? And, and you and I have spoken about this previously, you know, Wealth almost as a as a measure of intelligence, and I don't think there's any connection between the two, but we have these rules in place with respect to accredited investors, and I, I'm trying to understand where you fall out on this. Well, where do I fall out on? And the, the, the quick answer is, if you and I were sitting down to write the rules today, we would not come up with the rules that we have. And we would take into account the things that you worry about, which is uh, uh, sophistication, ability to understand uh, the investment decision, um, recourse in the event things go wrong, all, all, all of those factors that go into designing any set of rules. And we'd probably come up with 
at least I hope you and I would come up with some pretty satisfactory rules. Um, two things have happened. One is this has evolved from a stage when the definition didn't matter that much. Right. And, uh, you, you were either bank financed or public markets financed in the 1960s. That's, that's the way it was. There was very little um, uh, what I would call private market seed capital. And it was bad for the economy. It was, it was bad for the economy to not have venture and risk capital in small and medium-sized businesses. Okay? We evolved. We figured out that bringing um, venture and um, uh, private capital into small and medium-sized businesses would do a great deal for the American economy. And I don't think we'd be where we are today in terms of leading the world in technology had we not done that. So with with that in mind, at, at some point we had between 8,000 and 9,000 public companies. We've made it so hard for companies not just to go public, but to um, maintain a public company status with respect to all of the regulations and requirements. So now we're in a position where we have less than 4,000 public companies. And of course, the private capital markets have exploded in, I would say, a good way. If, if, is there a world in which we can fix the current regulations required for companies to be public? Well, a lot of people take the cause and effect here um, in order for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. So, What we have done in the public company arena is we've used our SEC registration process and our public reporting process to do much, much more than it did in 1970, 1980, 1990. Just look at the size of documents today, and people will say, oh, companies have become larger and more complex. Yes, some have, but for your average monoline, mid-cap company, it's not that complicated a company to understand, but yet the pages and pages of disclosure and the like have gone on more because we've tacked a lot on to our public company reporting system that is tangential to um, what, what is really, am I, am I able to make a good investment decision? Some of, some of it's been, been good, but, but a lot of it has made it more complex and more difficult. That's true. If you do that, the threshold level to become, for it to make sense for it to become a public company goes way up. So let me just give you a pragmatic. Um, when I first started doing IPOs, if, you're, if your IPO was going to be $70, $80 million and you're going to have uh, you know, a market cap after that of three, $400 million, nine out of 10 times I was encouraging you, the founder said to me, hey, Jay, do you think I should do something? Yeah, you know what? Cost of capital is cheaper. You can handle this. You're ready to be a public company. By the time I went to the SEC, that number was probably, except for like biotech and a few areas, that number was probably, you know, three, four, five hundred million afloat, maybe more, and a couple billion dollars before you would get to that. Right. And and you would say to them, and you know, you have to really want to do this because you're going to spend every quarter 15 days on what it takes to be a public company as opposed to three or four days that you used to spend on getting ready for quarterly. That that's the trade off and you're gonna to have to be you're gonna to have to get used to. Um, and 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 the person who really loses in this, at least in my opinion, I'll be curious to hear what you say, is the retail investor. Because yeah. those companies who would otherwise have chosen to go public when you could raise 30, 40, 50 million dollars and go public at a 300, 400 million dollar market cap, they don't go public anymore. Right. They stay private and, and, and they do, you know, a walled garden round with uh, a few institutional investors, even if a few are needed. Right. That could be that could be one investor. So, Eric, let, let me go back to the um, sort of chicken and egg. And a lot of people will say that the that threshold for an IPO making sense moved way up because of the private capital. 
I actually think it's much more the other way around. As the threshold moved up, the opportunities for private capital became larger, and that's what that's what fostered. It. And then people realized, okay, there there's this alternative. It's getting cheaper. The more private capital available, the cheaper it gets. And now we have had this ecosystem where you have the public capital markets and private capital markets. Now, another thing that I want to make clear is that people will give you numbers on the size of the private capital markets. And then they'll say, well, aren't there a lot of individuals who are therefore exposed to these private capital markets? The answer is no. Most of the money in the private capital markets is institutional money. Um, and your, your question is rightfully, okay, if we have these large private capital markets um, and it's institutional money and they're getting the advantage of the growth in the private markets, shouldn't ordinary people have access to those markets? And the answer is, of course. And let me just say one last thing. There are people who say, okay, these markets have gotten so big, the, the retail investor has access to um, the public capital markets, access to the private capital markets um, is, is difficult, has frictions. What we should do is just mandate that the private markets become public. Well, you know, that, that's basically saying we had, we had you know, inefficiencies, the market spoke with its feet, let's add those inefficiencies back. That that's ludicrous, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's it may be, but it's certainly the view of um, more than a few people who uh, think that the way to solve a problem is to make the problem worse. So the 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 correction should actually be to reverse a lot of what's happened in the public markets. I think you and I probably agree on agree on that. Um, and and I think I think ninety five percent of investors would agree on that. So, okay, we're not going to solve Congress in a, in a, in in the next thirty minutes. But um, in in terms of expanding the definition of accredited investor and allowing more people to participate in the private markets, your team had a very thoughtful way to to do that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. And, and like I said, there's going to be a debate about whether the wealth or income thresholds are too high or too low. Um, we said, OK, they may be too high or too low, but it's clear that a number of people who who have the wherewithal and have the experience to be in the private markets are being excluded. Let's find another way to qualify other than income and, and wealth. Start with something easy. If you can qualify to sell investments of that type, you want to be able to buy them. Another right. one is if you're employed by a company like this, you ought to be able to put some of your investment dollars to work in that company. Those were two pretty straightforward ones. I would like to see that perspective expanded and add other ways that people can clearly demonstrate their competence, their ability to bear risk, to have access to the, to the private markets. And then there's a final one, which is, if you're investing alongside very sophisticated investors on the same terms, you can get a lot of comfort from that. It, uh, on that point, I, I'd love to see a scenario whereby it, if, say, 80% or 90% of the total dollars invested in a fund were institutional or QP, qualified purchaser dollars, that that the delta, the remainder can allow for participation with the retail investor for the exact reason that you've just pointed out, which is there seem to be some guardrails because you would expect the institutional investor and the qualified purchasers to at least have done a certain amount of due diligence in advance of retail investors doing it for themselves. Um, I, I'd love to see well, that happen. Well, you're so right. And it also takes something that is tried and true from the public markets and applies it to the private markets. One of the great, and I love, I love the architecture of the public markets. What we do in the public markets is retail investors sit side by side with sophisticated investors. Much of the company disclosure, financial statements, and the like is poured over by those institutional investors. Some retail investors do it, but by and large, retail investors ride along with that rigorous 
institutional investor approach, that's what happens. The same thing can be replicated in the private markets, I think, relatively easily. So, you know, it sort of reminds me of my old investment banking days and roadshows and IPOs. You know, companies go on the road and they're pitching the large institutional investors to build out that book for when the company goes public. And then there's a certain amount that gets allocated eventually to the to the retail investor. But you get institutional buy in first. Retail investor second. I'd love to see that happen. Uh, love to see that happen in the private markets. Look, and, um, and, and institutional discipline in the public markets is, is something that is taken for granted, but it's one of the real um, benefits of U.S. public markets. So this seems to be going backwards. I saw a recent proposal. I think it was in the um, as part of Build Back Better, or maybe it was Competes. This idea that private companies who would be raising $25 million in a single offering or maybe more than $50 million uh, during the year. And these would be 506B, 144A, Reg S type offerings would be required to to file a certain set of disclosures with the SEC that they're not currently required to do. That, that seems like a step backwards, not forwards. Well, it may be it may be a step in the direction that we talked about, which is there are some who believe that because of the growth of the private markets, that you need to impose public market disclosure requirements on the private markets, rather than recognizing that the private markets have functioned you know, quite well. And to folks who are are making those types of proposals, that is elevating the required disclosure standards in the private markets, I ask, where is where is the issue you're trying to address? Where is the benefit of including that um, additional requirement? And sometimes people come back and say, well, um, you know, information makes things better. These are very sophisticated markets with very sophisticated buyers, they're generally able to get all the information they need. And sophisticated sellers too, <laughs> you know, in, in, in terms of following the rules and providing, uh, providing disclosure. Um, and, and now, now look, there, there are abuses in the private markets, but they're generally not in the areas that we're talking about. Right. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about people um, you know, with Ponzi schemes, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the type, what I would say is the, the types of charlatans that these measures do not do anything to deter. There's a lot of, there are a lot of other things that you can do. And we did to deter those, you know, we, we, we cleaned up the penny stock, uh, dark company, um, uh, avenues for those folks. Um, we added databases for um, people who are were found uh, to have committed fraud in these areas. If you want to go after those types, go after them directly. So we spoke about it earlier, and um, clearly we still have a little bit of the wild, wild west with respect to, to crypto. Um, and you, you mentioned ICOs, and for a little while there, uh, everyone was sort of focused on one definition of what it means to be a security. I'm wondering if you can uh, help us all understand what a security is and what qualifies, what doesn't qualify. In the in the wake of the Great Depression, uh, the architects of the Securities Act and the Exchange Act uh, essentially saw that both in the raising of capital and in the trading of instruments, there was the opportunity for fraud on the general public. And so when they constructed them, they said in those two areas, and th this, is, this is really crucial because when we're talking about the private markets, we're still talking about securities. In those two areas, uh, if you're raising capital or you're, or you're providing for an exchange of stores of value, it's presumptive a security. So if you look at the definition of, of security that is 
contained in the Exchange Act and contained in the Securities Act. It's a long list of types of instruments uh, and types of functions. And people focused on you know, the Howey test because there had been a Supreme Court case and it's one of the more common ones. But if you look through that list, you'll see tradable share. You'll look back at cases, you'll see that warehouse receipts are, are viewed as securities. And it was surprising to me as a, as a student of the securities laws and their history that somehow people thought ICOs could be different. So I, I, was, I was quite surprised by that. And what, what the ICOs did was they tried to take private market disclosure and have public market distribution. Right. And what's fundamental is if you're operating the private markets, you know, you have a lower disclosure burden, but you don't get the benefit of being able to go out to the public. And, and I'm going on, but why is this so important? Because really what the securities laws are about is leveling the playing field on information. And if you're in a private relationship, you can privately negotiate the information that you need to make a decision. If you're going out to the public in a public market and just quoting prices, you don't have opportunity for that negotiation. So you have to provide a, a much greater level of information. That's, that's the architecture. So, so bring this back to the one crypto asset, which um, most people today have at least heard of, Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin not a security? There, there are commodities and, um, as opposed to securities. Now, now, let me say, if you look at this in a principles-based way and you go back to what I was saying about the promoters of a venture having information that the purchasers of the, the securities, the instrument, do not have. You have your typical company construct and the like where you're investing in my company, I know all about my company, um, I need to tell you about it. One of the ways to look at the difference between a security and a commodity is a commodity doesn't have that kind of centralized basis of information, promotion, profit. You know, gold is mined all over the world. It may have different um, qualities and the like, but it's generally viewed of as gold. And so the, the price for gold is, is not set based on the information that one particular person has or another um, and the like. That is one way to look at the difference. But looked at through the other end of the telescope, if you were going to go to someone or some group of people or some network of people and say, provide me with disclosure about the future production of Bitcoin, it'd be difficult to find out who that person was. Because you can, we all, we all, we all know it's based on a formula and, you know, uh, there's a cap and this, and, you know, there's not, there's not that much more to say. So that is why, um, as Bitcoin came up, it gravitated toward the commodity side of the re regulatory divide. So uh, obviously we have a new chairman of the SEC right now. I don't know how your how clear the Chris, your your particular crystal ball is is in terms of predicting what uh, crypto new crypto securities laws or or regulatory regulatory environment we may see develop here. But I'm just sort of an open open ended question as to what do you think is going to happen. Well, look, I, I think go back to what I, what I talked about, which is the presumption in our federal securities laws is that if you are raising money for a venture or if you're providing people with tradable interests in an in, in underlying business, an underlying project, that the securities laws apply. In addition, if you're creating uh, lending products, um, the securities laws apply. We have a general architecture in the U.S. that in financial products, there is at least one regulator who has oversight. Think about it that way. And I think that, that that's a much better way to think about it than searching for a product or service that has no regulator. And then, let me make one last point on this. Yeah, um, please. And I think people miss um, just because 
you you may not be offering a security. Maybe you're offering a commodity. Maybe you're offering something. Else. Doesn't mean that general anti-fraud rules don't apply. States attorneys general all over the country have powerful anti-fraud rules. So if you're out telling somebody this product is going to do X, but you're not telling them that there are all of these risks associated with that product, and you're you're you think you're safe in not disclosing all those risks because you had some view that it's not a security or it's not a banking product or it's not something else. It doesn't mean that states attorneys general aren't going to look at. It. So, crypto staking and lending, securities laws should apply. Well, look, I like I, I always say I'm not going to get into any, and I want to be clear, I'm not going to get into the nuances of any individual product. But the right perspective to examine any kind of financial product is there's probably a regulation that applies to this function that I need to be cognizant of. So I'm going to take it back to the personal. Thank you, by the way. This was excellent. Um, you are the first person to say that Stockholm was their favorite place. Can you, can you tell us why? Well, I, I, uh, I have no facility with languages, and I pretty much look like I'm from America, but I've traveled <laughs> all over the world. It's probably the only place that I've ever been mistaken for a local. Wow. Okay. <laughs> because they speak English so well. <laughs> there you go. And and so your your last meal, God, I just love every part of this. Fish and chips with Guinness, chocolate cake, and red wine. I'm not sure it gets any better. That's you know, you asked. Uh, yeah, I, I I just love that. So no. now the biggest surprise on the questionnaire, by the way, for me anyway, I said still on the bucket list, and you said getting barreled on the North Shore. And so first, I'm going to ask you to tell everyone what getting barreled means, and then I'm not sure which North Shore you're referring to. <laughs> so so the the North, the, I'm not a great surfer. Okay, I wish I, I wish I were. And I, I think, I don't know if, if, you, if you've ever seen it live, there's nothing more amazing than, than watching people inside the tube of the wave um, on the North Shore of Oahu, because it lasts about three seconds and it, it looks like it's just, you know, enough scare for a lifetime. But well, it's, it's may, may, cool. may, may you get barreled while you still can. <laughs> I, those, days, those days are gone. <laughs> Jay, thank you for uh, for sharing your time with us. I greatly appreciate it. As always, great to see you. And um, just thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Great time. The Altogether Show is brought to you by Alto. Alto knows that achieving true portfolio diversification means investing in more than just stocks and bonds. That's why Alto developed a streamlined platform to make it easy and cost-effective to invest tax-advantaged retirement savings in alternatives, assets like real estate, venture capital, and crypto, that are outside of the public markets and available through Alto's growing list of investment partners. To learn more, visit altoira.com altogether.